welcome. If you guys would grab your Bibles, as we are accustomed to, and open with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. We're not going to be carrying on the, the Gospel of John this morning. We're going to look at the account of the birth and look to the Word of God and keep Jesus where he belongs, right in the middle of all of this. Amen? You know, as I was studying, I, I heard uh, a story of a pastor who was Uh, It was back earlier in his ministry, and he was buying a pair of those, I don't know what you call them, but they're kind of standard. They're the little black shoes that are super shiny for his daughter, right? The little patent black patent leather. There it is. That's the official name. I don't know if they're leather. They always look like shiny plastic to me, but and not very comfortable. But he was in uh, the mall, the store buying the, the pair of shoes, and it was, a, she was younger, she was like five, something like that, years old, four or five, and the lady, the attendant that was helping him try the shoes on said, well, what's Santa going to bring you this Christmas? And she looked at the uh, attendant and said, we don't believe in Santa. <laughs> and so, the, the attendant, he said, looked at them like, you murderers, like just that look, like, oh, who do I call to report these, these parents of this child? And she said, that the attendant looked at, that, looked at her and said, well, then what is Christmas about? If it's not about Santa, and if it's not about presents, and the little girl said, Jesus was born on Christmas. And what a testament. And that's, I was thinking about that story, thinking this is what our world needs. It's what we need to keep Jesus in the center of his story. That's history, his story. And so this morning, we're we're just going to do that. We're going to take a simple look at the gospel of Luke chapter 2, a simple look at the account that Luke brings us of what happened this night. It was an amazing, glorious, powerful night, but also, man, it was a plain, humble little Christmas. It was simple. It was actually lowly, but it was the night that our King and Messiah was born. So, let's check it out. Look with me at Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass... In those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And so she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So here we have this scene sort of set for us of what we're going to be looking at this morning in the little town of Bethlehem. Before we get into that, though, I want to back up a little bit further to the very beginning of Luke's gospel, and I want to bring something to our attention. Luke is the author, of course, of the gospel of Luke. He's referred to in uh, the New Testament writings, I believe by Paul, as Dr. Luke, who was an educated man. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and a continuation of the story of Jesus we know as the book of Acts. They go together. It's the continuation. It's a story. But if you go back to the very beginning, the first, I think, four verses of chapter 1, what we end up finding is Luke's purpose and intent and sort of the method that he uses to write the Gospel of Luke. He informs us that it is a written and put together set of accounts of the history that he has gathered in order to let us know, but also you'll see there, a man named Theophilus, that he would be able to know with certainty and accuracy 
the account of history that we have set before us. So I want us to keep that in mind. As we go through this story, it's a historical account written purposefully and meticulously to be the truth so that we would have an accurate account and be able to understand all that happened on well, what we're going to look at today on this first Christmas morning. So with that in mind, we have the scene that we're looking at, that Dr. Luke accounts for us back in chapter 2 in verses 1 through 5. And we do have to sort of look at a couple of things here. The first one, I think, that's kind of glaring and obvious, a big part of this section, is the census or the registration that took place. And basically what happened was the Caesar, which was like whatever, the president of Rome, the, the governor of Rome uh, at that time, he demanded a registration happen and that everyone would go to, to the hometown of their lineage in order that they would be counted. Anybody know why? For taxes, right? Because he wanted to get all, for some reason, I don't know what it was, he was feeling like, I'm not getting everything I'm owed. And so he's putting these people out on the street to go back to their home villages in order to be counted so that he could take everything that was supposed to go to him. Good old government. Then we see there, uh, in verse 2, just a, another quick reference that he gives, and it's for the accuracy of this account, that it was the season, it was this time, it was the registration uh, that took place during or when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. So another note that I want to bring out is Luke saying this is the specific one. It was when um, Caesar Augustus was on the throne of Rome and when Quirinius was governing Syria, specifically because, and we can see this from history, there was a small handful of times that this happened in Rome. It also happened in Egypt. There's record of that in Egypt. And so Luke's just being specific. He's giving us the details so that the people reading would know which time it was. And so we have Mary and Joseph they end up having to go to the town of Bethlehem, which is because of his lineage, because of his, uh, his birth, because of where his lineage goes. And it's their hometown, so to speak. Luke doesn't give specifics. He doesn't say they were born there. But he does say that because of Joseph's line, this is where they end up having to go. And so they had to go. <laughs> road trip, forced road trip. They weren't planning vacation. It's a forced road trip. And they've got to hop in the car and drive all the way to Bethlehem. Of course, that's a joke. There's no cars back in that day and age. But here they are. They're forced into what I would consider a hardship, something that they weren't planning, something they weren't really ready for. I mean, and it was about, it was roughly from the region of Galilee, the northern region, down to Judea, which is Jerusalem, the area around Jerusalem. Bethlehem was right outside of Jerusalem. It was about an 80 mile trek, and they didn't have a car. And on top of all of these things, the honey is Prego. I don't know what kind of road trips you've had with the Prego wife. I don't know if you have or you've been the Prego, but it can be an interesting thing. And I think about this, and I think about the difficulty of making this trek without the creature comforts that we have. I mean, we'd be like putting the seat back. Is there a way we can elevate your feet? All of the things. And here's Mary having to go this whole journey. I don't know. It's depicted on a mule, it could have been, Lord, I hope it was. I hope she didn't walk this journey, but that could have happened as well. Either way, I think about this, and the point being here is this wasn't easy. This was difficult. This was a hard thing. This was a trial. This was one of those things where you're going, God, really? Right now? Of all the times, the frustration not to mention the, the fear that comes with the first baby. I don't know if any of you guys have been there or related to that. There's a lot of unknown. I mean, second, it's like, we got this. We know what's coming. 
Maybe not quite. Maybe that's what the guys think. But either way, this was difficult. There was a a, a fear. There was the traveling. There was the road trip. There was what I'm guessing, at least in the third trimester, pregnant Mary, their first baby. And I guarantee you this, they did not have plans of, you know, let's go have a baby somewhere else. Nobody does that. They're like, no, I'm not going anywhere. In fact, naturally, there's the whole nesting season where you start getting the room ready or the place ready, the preparation. You are planning to stay. And now she's forced to go. No doubt she had frustrations and questions and why gods, but it was completely out of their control. It was completely out of their hands. It was something they had to. They were forced to do. It wasn't an option. And guess what? It was the perfect plan of God. All that happened was orchestrated by God. And we have a couple of things happening. We have a Caesar who believes he's in control, making a command, making a dictate that this is going to happen, but he's just being used by God as well. I don't know if there was a paranoia set in. Whatever it was, it was God working. And really, it was working not that all these people would go back and that Caesar would get money, but that so that one little couple would get to Bethlehem at this time. Why at this time? Because it was prophesied that the Savior would come and be born in Bethlehem. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. All of this was orchestrated by God. You mean the hardship? The difficulty? The trial? Yes. And I hope that's speaking to some of us in here this morning. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's going on in your life. It may be something hard. It may be something difficult. It may be something completely out of your control. And to you, I would say this, hold on. God has a plan. And also, Not only does he have a plan, he is working that plan out for good in your life if you are his. We see that from Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28, and I'm going to read it from the NLT. It says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for their life and are called according to his purpose for their life. Which brings a a couple of questions here. First of all, we know God is working everything out, but the question that it leaves is this. Whose plan or whose will am I working out in my life? And there's really two options. My plan or his plan. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, his plan for their life. And I believe this morning I can say with confidence that Mary and Joseph were out for God's plan in their life. And I think the biggest case for that, the biggest evidence for that, has to go back to Joseph, who at one point in his life was planning out his plan. And you remember what that was? It was to leave Mary. It was like, I'm going to do it honorably. I'm not going to make a scene, but she's pregnant and it's not my kid and I'm going to leave. But the Lord showed up and spoke to him through an angel and told him, don't be afraid. This is of God. God is doing this. He's bringing the Savior into the world. And so he stuck with God's plan and decided not to do his own plan, which let me just say, good advice for us, sticking to God's plan. Not having a plan B with my own purpose or my own intention or wisdom as the lead. And lo and behold, because they were yielded, because they were submitted to God, God used this difficult hardship, this trial, to perfectly, completely fulfill his purpose. Their surrendered lives to fulfill something so much bigger than themselves, something they didn't even understand at this time, what God would do through Jesus. Part of me wonders 
if and when later on in life the lights went on and they realized what God had done in their lives. If and when they realized what happened, maybe opening a scripture or someone coming to them and saying, do you realize that you went to Bethlehem and it completely fulfilled, it was out of your control, completely fulfilled the prophecy from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which says this, but you, O Bethlehem, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth one to be the ruler in Israel, who brings, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. And we get this depiction of the specific place the Messiah would come out of, would be born. In Bethlehem. As foretold, prophecies foretold, now being fulfilled in the life of these young kids. I mean, they're young, Joseph and Mary. I don't know. Mary was probably late teens, probably late teens. I was going to say early 20s, most likely late teens. And here we have God's word being fulfilled. And then this beautiful depiction of the one that would come who is from of old. It's going to be born, but he was before The world was created. This is God in the flesh. And we get this depiction that he is from everlasting. Now, I spent a lot of time kind of just going over the road trip, the difficulty, but God using that plan. So the second thing I want to talk about from the Gospel of Luke, specifically, is verse 7, which 6 and 7, I mean, it's the shortest description of the birth of Christ. And when I think about that, I think it's probably good. You know, when you hear birth stories, usually you don't want to hear all of the details of the birth stories that happen. Although, I mean, they're all different. They're all unique. Some of them have miracles. I think our kids, one of them was born with the umbilical cord around their throat, wrapped around completely. The other one, there was two other ones, one with one knot in the umbilical cord. And you could see the look on the doctor's face, the the the. the Heart rate was going down in contractions, and she's like, it's time now, you know. And she, you, you, you see that look on your doctor's face, and you think to yourself, am I going to make it? Big gulp. Ah. It's like when your barber says, oops, what, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then our most recent one had, she had two knots in her umbilical cord. And our doctor actually said, I've never seen this with the baby alive. Which, whoa, miracle, right? Anyways, we're not sure all the specifics, but we do get these little specifics of the account. And the first thing we see is because of the census and because of the small size of Bethlehem and it being right on the edge of Jerusalem, which was a hub, I'm sure a lot of people from Jerusalem, so people traveling and everyone being displaced, we get this little tidbit of information. There was no room in the inn. There wasn't a place for them to stay. They ended up having to wrap him in these swaddling cloths, which was a normal one, and then having to lay him in a manger, which isn't quite uh, normal. But this is what we gather from Scripture. It's very simple, yet a concise account from Dr. Luke of the birth of Jesus. So the first thing I wanted to, to mention, we'll hit those real quick. The first one is the inn. The inn was was known as a Cataluma. It was an interesting dwelling place, sometimes two, sometimes three stories. I think most of them were two, and it wasn't like a hotel we're thinking of or a motel from your mind. It was a place, the bottom was usually made out of like block, and it would have like a corral sort of pin area, a place of water, and a place for feeding uh, the animals that people coming through town would stop and put them in. And so they'd stay on the bottom. And then the second story or floor usually was the place where the people would hang out. And they would stay and they would spend the night. So it was kind of a shelter. A lot of times they wouldn't even have a roof on them. But there are places where you could sort of have some sort of, you know, keeping of the animals and, and feeling a little security. And so that's kind of the inn that would have been depicted there. Not the greatest inn, but there's not even room there. And then we see that Mary, and this is just a note. It says that she brought forth her firstborn son. And I don't know what you get from that text. When I read it, I think she was alone. 
She didn't have mom with her. I don't know her family was around. It was just her and Joseph. And she brought forth this child. No help. And I'm assuming Joseph was of help. It's not like he said, oh, this, I got to go, you know. Mom's calling, dinner's ready, I got to leave. Which I don't, that brings a whole other thought to my mind. Forgive me for thinking all this stuff, but it brings a whole other thought to my mind. Joseph was a man's man, and he was living in a whole different culture. He wasn't living in a place full of snowflakes. They went, birth is happening, oh, and they bring in another bed for the husband who can drink his juice box with his feet up. And go, honey, are you okay? You're doing great. I don't know if I'm going to make it, you know, kind of thing. This is something where Joseph was there, I'm sure, being strong for her, as strong as he could be. The third thing we see is that the babe was wrapped in swaddling cloths. And that was basically the equivalent of a baby blanket. It was really these strips of cloth, and it was something that was in their culture, their custom. They would wrap the baby tightly, which is like our day and age. It's the burrito baby, right? You wrap them up tight. They feel secure, comfort. And so this is how she wrapped him, which means something to me as I think about that. It means that motherly maternal instinct of Mary was working because she brought those with her. She was prepared. She was thinking, if we got to go, I'm bringing the blanket, I'm bringing a diaper bag, I'm bringing a car seat, stuff that you dads probably would have forgotten. I know I would have, right? And so we have this just, to me, beautiful wiring that God has put into women. And Mary has it. And then last of all, the manger. The manger was... Not, I mean, we, in our minds, it's made out of wood. There's fresh golden hay. It's just beautiful, sanitary, warm-looking thing. And the truth is, that word is a feeding trough. And what a feeding trough was in that day and age was usually on the ground, and it was kind of like a stone dish. And it was, any of you guys ever been to a barn? It was stinky. It smelled bad. I don't know if any of you guys, we have one of those weird kids where when we're driving down by the, like the dairy farms in the valley, she liked to roll the window down and go, oh. I'm like, put the window up. It's disgusting. Are you kidding me? There's piles of manure. There is things that we don't want coming in, odors we don't want in our car. All that to say, this is the set of circumstances for the most high God to be born. You know what this speaks to me more than anything else? Is that God loves and values humility. Lord, forgive us when we're proud. Forgive us when we think that something's below us. Lord, help us to be humble. And we're going to see this a little bit later, but humility means it makes you approachable. Pride and arrogance it makes you kind of untouchable. Humility makes you approachable. And this is a part of Jesus coming to this earth. So now let's change the scene and go out to this unlikely group of, I guess you could call them messengers to the world. Let's check it out in verse 8. In verse 8, Luke chapter 2. Now there were in the same country... That area surrounding Bethlehem, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men. So man, we have a whole nother scene. Now we're outside of Bethlehem in the field 
with an interesting group of people. It's a group of these shepherds who are out at night watching their flocks. Basically, they're doing what shepherds do, right? They're out in the fields. They're watching their flocks. They're there to protect their flocks. Now, a few things about this this group, about shepherds. The first one that just kind of blows me away is it says that they lived in the fields. And that immediately takes me to a more modern term of, uh, of cowboys, right? I mean, these people that are ranchers, so to speak, but they don't have a ranch. So they're out in the field. They're living with the animals that they're protecting. Uh, they're out there leading them uh, to water, leading them to places with food, protecting them from any danger that would come against their herd, which really was their livelihood, right? So this is what they do for a living. They're shepherds. They probably didn't smell too good. They probably hadn't had a bath in a while, but this is where they're at. Now, some people go in the direction to say that these shepherds were social outcasts in Jesus' day, that they were like crooks and their word was no good, which it could be. But when I think about the biblical view of shepherds, what I get isn't quite the same. I'll tell you one thing, though. Biblically, we know this for certain, that shepherds, they weren't the top of the food chain. They weren't the bottom, probably closer to the bottom. But they were just the blue-class normal guys, the blue-collar working, right, normal working guys. This is what they did, out there working. You know, the only negative view that we get of shepherds is really when Joseph is in Egypt and then he calls Jacob and their whole family to come during the famine to Egypt to stay in the land of Goshen, which the land of Goshen was outside of Egypt. And, and when the Egyptians found out that they were shepherds, they're like, great, we need some more shepherds because we want more food, but we don't want to touch the animals and the grossness, so we'll have your family do it. That'd be great. And so kind of we have the sort of uppity Egyptians going, you know, we, we want the, the produce from the, basically in modern day vernacular, they would say, we like chicken nuggets, but we don't want to see no chickens. Like, ugh, right? Kind of thing. But really all the other places that we see shepherds, they're usually not, criminals. They're not the worst people. They're, again, low on the totem pole, so to speak, of the economy, but they're just workers. Now, in in Jesus' day and age, I would say this is probably, they were probably a little bit more so lower on the totem pole than like, and I'll just not, I'll, I'll just name drop one of the shepherds that we first see in the Bible. That's Abraham. Abraham was a keeper of the flocks. The father of the nation of Israel was a shepherd and he was wealthy. God had blessed his flocks. So he was a flock owner. Now we would kind of gather that these shepherds in this economy were probably working for someone that owned the, the flocks. So they're probably not as well to do as Abraham, but they're out watching the sheep. Now that leads us to another really interesting note. I don't know if this is true, but it kind of like just sparks the what if. There is, historically speaking, there there was a group of shepherds that kept flocks for the temple. And they kept those flocks right outside of the city of Bethlehem. That is a historical fact. Now, because they were keeping flocks of sheep for the temple, those flocks they were keeping were meant to be sacrificed to God. God. And that thought right there in and of itself, to me, is just sort of loaded with built-in irony because the thought is, what if those shepherds were the ones that God chose to bring this message to? And then in turn, for them to go and tell the whole town that the Lamb of God has come, the real Lamb of God, who's come, like John the Baptist said, to take away the sins of the world. Just an interesting thought. So up until this point, it's a normal night in the life of the shepherds. It's dark. They're out in the field. But then verse 9 happens. An angel of the Lord shows up and the glory of the Lord shone around them, which is to say God turned the light on. It got bright in a dark field real quick. I don't know about you. I would have been scared. It says they were greatly afraid. In our language, that means they were flipping out. They're like, what is happening? And I can't blame them. I totally would have been completely afraid, scared to death. But of course, the angel saw them 
and probably saw how white their faces got in the light of God and said to them in verse 10, do not be afraid for behold, which is to say, don't be afraid, but look, I've brought you some good news. I've brought you good news, good tidings, same kind of thing, of great joy, which will be to how many people? All people. I don't know about you, but my Gentile heart gets full when I hear that because that's me. He doesn't say to the nation of Israel, this is for everyone. And then he goes on to reveal, and here is the good news in verse 11. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And there it is. That's the gospel. I think that's the first time the gospel is mentioned, at least in that New Testament setting. This is the declaration. There's good news. There's a Savior who's come. He is Christ, which means the anointed one. He is the Messiah, the one spoken of in the prophets of old. And also he is, lastly, the Lord. I think about this radical, true statement made by the angel, and then I think about who it's made to. And I just, again, am connecting dots. It's not by accident that God chose simple folk to bring this news to. Because the very first thing he says is a savior. And I don't know about you, but if you were raised upper crust, which I don't know what that means, but whatever. If you were raised thinking that you're privileged and all of these things, and somebody said, hey, good news, a savior. They'd be thinking, a savior of what? What are you talking about? But these humble men, they knew they needed a savior. And they wanted a savior. To save us from what? I would say this, and we know this for certain, to save us from ourself, from our sin, from the things that we do that are at odds with the glory and holiness of God. And we do them all the time, sometimes on purpose, sometimes we don't even know. But we need that Savior. And the angel came to tell these shepherds, there's good news, he is here. And he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. Which that verse, that statement, I should say, ties in all of the prophecies of the Messiah, the anointed one that God would send. That angel is saying, he's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is it. He is the one. And the last definition has got to be my favorite. And he's the Lord. Which means to the shepherd, he is the true master of your life. And again, it takes that humility to be able to accept that. I need a master. You know, I think of old Bob, old Bob Dylan, right? You got to serve somebody. It's the truth. And when you serve the true master, it makes all the difference in the world. Then the angel says in verse 12, and this will be a sign to you. In other words, this, by this you will know which one he is, which baby he is that you find. First of all, he says, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, which again, that was ordinary. That was common in that day and age. But the second, he'll be laying in a feeding trough. What? Laying in the feeding trough? You know, it was so important that the angels gave them that tidbit of information because if you had to tell shepherds, a king is born, where are they headed? The palace. No, you have to understand, he's going to be, for lack of a better words and no pun intended, born in a barn. You're going to have to go find him humble, lowly, no place in the inn, to find this Savior. And this is it. This is the crazy. This is where the King of Kings, the great I am, the Emmanuel, God with us, was purposed to be born so that all could come from the top down. I don't know if you guys have ever heard 
Gail Irwin's description of what he would have done if he was setting up the birth of the Messiah of the world. And, and it's, I love his description. He says, no, no normal hospital would do, especially no manger, but no hospital would do. Not sanitary enough. I would bring a huge hospital, completely white, and I would just let it hover down from the sky and land on the ground with the biggest diamond you could ever see on the top of it so that everyone knows this is the king of the world. But Jesus was born in the barn. He wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth, probably a feather or some straw. He has a a normal, humble life so that whosoever would come to him can. In other words, all are welcome and all can come. If he was born with that silver spoon, you know there would be people that say, well, he can't relate to me. Why would I come to him? But he came humble and lowly. Then, and this is another amazing part of this historical account to me, in verse 13, the accompaniment arrives, all the other hosts, which is really a word sort of for a military troop. All these other hosts accompany, they, you call them the backup band if you want, they come in a multitude, a great number, to praise God, to bring glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good will towards men. And you know what pops into my mind is that they finally got their chance and their opportunity to speak forth boldly what God had done. And, and kind of what comes to mind is like the kids at the, at the maybe the Christmas Eve service that we're going to have at the high school auditorium tonight. You know, those little nervous kids going up there in front of all the people and standing on the stage and then singing their heart out singing the best that they can. And I think, what was it like watching these angels waiting to get their chance to proclaim praise for the Savior of the world? Were they nervous? Were they like, stop it, quiet, he's coming. We're gonna, we're gonna have our opportunity. Don't touch me, don't mess around. And then to, to come out and say and proclaim, and I would have to say that those Angels praised God with all that they could, with all that they had within them to proclaim the glory to God in the highest and the peace and goodwill towards men with all that they had within them. And after the amazing angelic worship session came to a close, we get to see the response as we wrap up this morning in verse 15. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in that trough, just as the angels said. Verse 17, and now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Man, so again, I hear this and I, and I think a couple of thoughts. The first thing is that, that kind of pop in my head is going back to what I spoke of right at the beginning. That Luke kind of put these accounts together. And so the first thought for me is, did Luke get to interview Mary? He sure could have. Did he interview the shepherds? Maybe. He sure could have interviewed these. And if so, what would it have been like to look into the eyes of someone after the death, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and ask them what was it like when he was born? 
Man, and in my mind's eye, tears are hitting the table. I never knew all that he would be. I never knew what I had in my arms that night when I held this baby who would become the lamb, the offering for my sin and die to save me. And I, I believe Mary understood that at the end of her life. I believe that at the end of her life, she would make that profession, Jesus, the baby born from my womb, is my Savior and my Lord. And to think about this scene, to think about this child, all I have to say in reading this lowly account is to say, he's worthy of so much more. He's worthy of all of our lives. He's worthy of our voices. But again, it was on purpose that God chose shepherds to reveal this truth. The humble, lowly shepherds in the field. Because they're like us. They're no one special. But they're still the ones that God chose to reveal his son to. And then in turn to take that message and to give it to the world around us. I mean, when I look at the shepherds and what they did, it was the first Thursday door-to-door -door ministry. They went out after they saw that news and after they spent time sitting and looking at this baby, probably in wonder, thinking, this is the king of kings. I mean, you know what happens when you see a baby. You start looking at him and you go, look at the fingernails. Oh my goodness. Look at the nose. Look at the little eyes. And you just are in awe of the beauty. And, and so here they're looking at this little baby thinking, this is the king of kings. This is our Messiah, our Savior. And they go out with humility, taking the good news, the gospel. Again, no one special, but with the greatest, most important message ever known to mankind, the gospel. The Savior has come. And then in verse 15, they couldn't not go. They're so excited. They, I just Again, I picture a bunch of younger shepherd guys. I put myself in their sandals, and they're like, okay, let's go. We got to go see him. And they take off. They run. And then, and then again, in my imagination runs as they come in, as they actually find the baby. They come into that stall, and they tell Mary and Joseph what they saw in the field. And I, I just cannot help. This is, this is again, kind of, it's not in the Bible. It's my imagination as I see this scene. Could you imagine Mary and Joseph's encouragement? They just got reiterated to them something they were already told, but sometimes we forget the words that were already spoken, and they're spoken again. This is the Messiah. The angels came and told us, and to see their excitement, to see little baby Jesus, how amazing it is. And after the shepherds, we're not sure how long they beheld Jesus, but afterwards, after looking at him, thinking about all the angels said, they couldn't hold back, they couldn't hold it in, they had to go and tell all the people they could in Bethlehem. They ran to tell. And everyone they told, it says, they, were, they marveled. They just were like, wow, the Messiah is here. Uh, let me just tell you really quickly, that was not a foreign idea. I think if that happened in America, we'd be like, what are you talking about? In their culture, they knew there was a Messiah to come. They were waiting for the Messiah expectantly, and now they're hearing the news. He has come. But I think the other one that just gets me is verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and she just pondered, she just chewed, she thought about them in her heart. And the shepherds returned back to the field, glorifying God, praising God for all the things they had seen as it was told them. So Mary's marveling with this newborn in her arms at who God is, at God's crazy, amazing plan. Still, I, I, I also think of these shepherds, just normal guys, God using the normal people 
to carry the news of the great Messiah. And I, I picture verse 20 again playing out in my mind. As they're going back to the field, they're like, can you believe what happened tonight? I never, if you'd have told me this at the beginning of the night, I'd have said, what, you're crazy. But look at what happened. The angels came. We saw the Messiah, the excitement. And that broke into a session of worship and praise to God for his faithfulness, for his goodness. And I, I think, of, like myself, did they, did they come to the place where they realized that God reached down to them, picked them, chose them, gave them that gospel message, visited them. And I'm so thankful that Jesus visited us. I want to ask uh, my dad and, and mother to come up. They're the worship leaders. As we close uh, with this last worship song, but I, I want to come back to, to just one more thought really quickly. And it's this idea of God using shepherds throughout the scripture. I already mentioned that God used Abraham, and Abraham was a shepherd. God also used Jacob, Abraham's son. God used, well, actually Jacob's, his grandson. But God used Jacob, and Jacob was, Jacob was a little rascal, right? He was the one out there painting dots on the goats and then putting stripes on the other ones. Uh, really, he threw a stick in the, you got to read it. You got to read that thing for yourself, not this morning. But God used Jacob. God also used another individual who was raised kingly, but then went out into the shepherd fields to learn and be discipled by God. I'm talking about Moses, one of the greatest figures in the history of Israel, raised in Pharaoh's palace, but then sent out to the back of the wilderness with his father-in-law's flocks to learn what it was like to be a shepherd, to be humble, to be lowly. And then, of course, the greatest king in the history of Israel started out as a shepherd boy, kind of lowly in the father's house. These are all my boys. Is that it? Well, there's one more, but he's out with the sheep, right? Just humble, lowly. And it was King David that was raised up to be a mighty king and a mighty man of God. Failures, yes, but a man after God's own heart. And I think about God using shepherds, and I say, why wouldn't he use shepherds in this scene? Because Jesus, this baby being born, is the great shepherd king. Not like the king of the shepherds, but Jesus is a shepherd. In fact, in the Gospel of John chapter 10, there's a whole section about Jesus being our shepherd, the one who protects us, the one who leads us to the food, brings us to the water, and makes us lie down the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 3, that God, Jesus, opens the door and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And continuing on in John chapter 10, he says, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And then finally he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. When I think of Jesus being our shepherd, I go all the way back to the prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that we looked at. It spoke of him being born in Bethlehem. Well, the rest of that prophecy, I'm going to read it, it's two verses, is this. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord of hosts, and they shall abide. 
For now he shall be called great to the ends of the earth. And this one, this Savior, this Messiah, this Shepherd, he shall be peace. I want to close this morning and just ask you if you have that peace of the shepherd in your heart. I want to challenge you to open your heart and allow Jesus into your life. To tell him, Lord, I need a shepherd. And if you said you are the door to the sheep, the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through you, I want to come in. And simply to say, Jesus, I accept that you are the Lamb of God who died to take away my sin. And then from that point for us this morning, I I hope you do that. If you haven't, I'd love to pray with you afterwards. But from that point for us this morning, to take, take a step back from that greater gospel message and say, Jesus, we're thankful that you came It's the beginning of the best thing that ever happened. That you would come to save us from ourself. So let's bring our hearts before him. You guys stand with me. And let's sing like the angels sang that night. We adore you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes, God, you alone. You. They said that night, we give you the glory. Jesus, we praise you this morning. We stand in awe. God, we are in wonder at this baby and this life and the words you would speak and the death you would die. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this reminder. Thank you that in this season, we can focus in on what Christmas is all about, what life is all about. So thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Thank you for the hope, the peace, the love that we have because of you. Lord, help us like Joseph to yield our lives to your plan. God, help us to surrender more. We thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's children said, amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.